Hello everyone, I'm the Enforcer and welcome to the breaking news. Please make sure to like, comment, and subscribe and support us on Patreon, link in the description below. Beginning with our breaking news today, Ukrainian armed forces have been able to break through in massive part in the area around Propove as video footage has surfaced showing a Ukrainian brigade crossing the area after engineering and construction vehicles have now set up a bridge over the anti-tank ditch. We're going to have to be muting the audio in this clip, but nevertheless, we can see that this is the 56th Brigade that is crossing this area, and we can see them crossing in mass. This is a large part of the unit and also an incredibly massive amount of armor that is being brought over by this brigade, and from what we can understand, this is the first major breach of the line. We have seen breaches of the line so far where Ukrainian infantry companies have been able to cross the Surovikin line and make it into Verbove, but we've never seen armor support arrive yet on the eastern and southern sides of this Surovikin line until today. It appears that Ukrainian forces are making some leeway advances in this area and making sure to move up armor support that will be able to help the infantry to take on the Russian forces. Of course, the 58th Combined Arms Army of the Russian Federation, the defending force on the southern side of the Surovikin line, is trying desperately to stop this breakthrough, but nevertheless, it appears to have been completely unsuccessful, and it appears that the counterattacks that the Russians have also been conducting over previous days have been to no avail, as Ukrainian engineers have now made it possible for an entire Ukrainian unit with all of the support and equipment that it needs to be able to cross the Surovikin line. We can even see the Russians in this clip attempting to shell the crossing over the anti-tank ditch as the Ukrainians continue to use it. And we can continue to see in very low resolution, Ukrainian vehicles making steady progress throughout the area and making their way towards Verbove. We're going to be ending the video clip here, but nevertheless, incredible to see that they've been able to break through not just the infantry at this point, but also heavy armor that can support this infantry, and this is probably a death knell for the Russian defenders that are inside of Rebove. It appears that currently the Russian BDV forces that are along the length of Novoprokopivka, which we heard possibly came from the 64th uh, Air Mobile Brigade of the Russian Army, it appears that they are currently uh, still stopping the Ukrainians for the most part in that direction due to their onslaught of constant counterattacks being directed against the Ukrainian offensive, which is still attempting to push forward down the highway. However, the story is completely different near Verbove, where we saw that the Ukrainians are now funneling armor across that open threshold and on towards the village itself. Based off of that, we'll probably see that the area of Verbove will probably go into a state of collapse for the Russian army here soon, and they'll probably desperately try and pull forward strategic reserves, or possibly even shift around the BDV that's in the rear lines near Chernovirka uh, towards the area of Verbove to hopefully try and slow or stomp the Ukrainian advance until the Rasputitsa can arrive in about a month or a month and a half. But at the moment, this is breaking news, and absolutely incredible to see that the Ukrainians have been able to finally construct a crossing that armored vehicles can use in massive numbers. Moving on from that, and into the area of Azerbaijan, it appears that the Russians' focus may also be torn, not just in two different areas around the Robotne front line, but also into Azerbaijan as well. Many of y'all may know about the current ongoing situation in between Armenia and Azerbaijan as the uh, Nagorno-Karabakh area, which exists somewhere around where my mouse cursor is circling, is heavily contended by both the Azerbaijanis and the Armenians to be their territory, one or the others. Armenia claims control over the Nagorno-Karabakh enclave because it has an ethnically large amount of Armenians within it. That's also why you see that some of the towns inside of this area have uh, English and Armenian names to them, like you can see over here as well. That is not normal for most Azerbaijani towns. Nevertheless, Azerbaijan also claims control of the area, and while it is ethnically majority Armenian, at the same time, it's almost largely been a part of Azerbaijan. It's a very gray area sort of conflict. There isn't anything that one could morally look to and say that there is a clear right side. Both sides have employed some very questionable tactics in trying to secure control over this area, and it does appear that the Russians have also been here as well, and they have been here for an incredibly long time, ever since the first Nagorno-Karabakh war ended an incredibly long time ago in the middle of the 90s. 
Since then, the Russians have been heavily involved in this area, and not only that, have had peacekeepers here. And during the current armed conflicts, six Russian peacekeepers have been killed in attacks by Armenian paramilitary groups, and it appears that the Russians may be trying to create some sort of a response. We can see right here that according to Nexta, uh, the Prosecutor General Office of Azerbaijan reported the deaths of six Russian peacekeepers. Two criminal cases have been initiate initiated. Sorry, everyone, I'm kind of stuttering here. But nevertheless... Six of them are dead, they're blaming it on the Armenians, and it appears that the Russians may possibly have to make a response to this if need be. Also, one of the members of this group that was killed was actually a deputy commander of the Russian Northern Fleet's submarine forces that was killed in that attack just today inside of that caravan where the other six Russian service members were killed. We don't know what kind of response the Russians will have. Of course, usually they're... Uh, their reflex response is to send a large armed force into an area when everything like that happens with official Russian army peacekeepers, but we haven't seen them make an official government response at the moment. However, one may be coming. Moving on into the area of the Bosphorus Strait, we also heard that one of the grain ships that was just arriving in Ukrainian waters around a day or two ago has now finally returned back to the Bosphorus with a full load of grain. It is loaded with 3,000 metric tons, and it is also going to be traveling on through the Bosphorus, the Dardanelles, and on into the Mediterranean safely beyond this point. It is a Palau flagship, much like the one that was uh, actually detained by the Russians for a short while around a month ago, and it appears that the Ukrainians, through their unrelenting resolve and overwhelming firepower against the Russian Black Sea Fleet, have somehow managed to keep the Russians at bay and to allow for a shipping corridor to open through the territorial waters of Bulgaria, Romania, and then finally into Ukraine. The ability for them to keep this area open is highly likely, actually, considering the territorial waters only expand around 12 miles out from a nation's coastline. And, of course, their economic waters or their, uh, well, not really territorial waters, but economic waters span out far greater. As long as these ships keep within 12 miles of the Ukrainian shoreline and the Russians don't employ the Kilo-class submarines... Um, they will probably be relatively safe from any kind of a Russian attack coming in the future against the shipping corridor. So incredibly good news to hear. And not only that, speaking of grain shipments from Ukraine, the Poles, the Slovakians, the Hungarians, and the Romanians appear to all finally be coming to a solution over the grain issue that started a few days ago. As many of y'all know, the grain situation was one that nearly came to blows according to what the news was reporting, but it does appear that that news was greatly overblown in the start, and that is why we have been waiting until this moment to report the story to y'all in its entirety. Basically, the premise goes that Ukrainian grain is so cheap, uh, cheaply produced that the price that Ukrainian farmers are able to sell the grain at is so low that it's predatorily competitive when outside of its own Ukrainian market. So when entering a nation like Poland, Hungary, or Slovakia, the grain is so cheap, it undercuts the domestic farmers within those countries so greatly that there is no possible way, as long as there is Ukrainian grain on the market, for those farmers to even sell their grain crops at all and to make a profit. This, is, of course, was causing some massive concerns within Poland, Slovakia, Hungary, and Romania, as their own agricultural sectors would possibly be strong-armed and possibly even destroyed by the incredibly low prices of Ukrainian grain. Because of this, the Poles decided that they were going to ban the import of Ukrainian grains, and in response to that, there was a little bit of a political back and forth. It didn't really seem to be that major, and according to a statement from the president of Poland, Andrzej Duda, he did claim that he is still friends with President Zelensky and urged uh, not to increase the degree of emotion since the dispute is regarding a very small segment of Ukrainian-Polish relations. Uh, the Polish president also told TVN24, which is the studio that was interviewing him, that he's ready to meet with Zelensky as soon as possible. And right after the statement was made, we understand that they actually are currently meeting right now in New York City uh, and are currently talking about some of the situations and issues that are facing Poland and Ukraine at this moment. But nevertheless, we also heard from Noel reports that they are also trying to fix the situation as best as possible in an overall uh, sense. And so hopefully we'll see a resolution to the Polish-Ukrainian grain situation, but a solution has also already been reached on the Slovakian grain situation, with Slovakia already lifting the ban on Ukrainian grain just days after it was put into effect. 
Of course, we don't know what kind of an agreement has been reached. We don't know if the price of Ukrainian grain will be artificially increased to make sure that domestic farmers are able to sell their crops at the at a competitive price compared to the ukrainians but nevertheless it is good to see that this was a fairly small hiccup and it's blowing over quite quickly as far as western support goes and as far as ukrainian and polish diplomatic relations are concerned along with all of their other eastern european allies but with that that is largely all of the breaking news we have today I've got to thank all of y'all so much once again for watching this breaking news. If y'all did enjoy, please make sure to subscribe. It makes us really happy when y'all do. And also like and comment on the video because that also helps out this channel a great deal as well. Uh, if Of course, if you enjoy these videos, we put them out nearly daily whenever possible. And hopefully we will have great news to report tomorrow. But with that, I will see you all in the next one.